watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. virtual edition of GHS TV's award-winning talk show, Crosstalk. I'm Caitlin Poindexter. Each week in this time slot, we take a look at different issues, personalities, and events that affect you and our community. Student education is just one of the many aspects of life affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Parents, students, and teachers have spent countless hours debating what is the safest way for students to return to school. The Shelby County School District, the largest school district in the state of Tennessee, decided to go all online for the 2020-2021 school year. Here to talk with me now about how SCS schools are continuing to pursue education against all odds is Kimberly Sanders, principal of Germantown Elementary School. Ms. Sanders, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. How difficult has the transition from in-person learning to complete virtual instruction been? I would like to venture to say not as difficult as I had anticipated before we started. Um, thankful to the district for the pushback of the start date, which gave our staff and teachers an extra month to plan and prepare for our students return virtually. Um, we haven't had as many hiccups as I anticipated. Um, we've been able to smoothly transition our students into getting on their devices and using our devices. And 100% of our staff at Germantown Elementary have actually completed all of the first eight required teams courses uh, for instruction. So that has helped a lot with our transition. So I would venture to say it hasn't been as difficult as I initially thought it would be. Um, but each day we start over every day as a new day just to make it better um, than the day before for our students. Can you describe what challenges you overcame throughout the process of organizing the different parts of Microsoft Teams? I think one of the biggest challenges that we had to overcome was just the student access and what students were able to do um, as being a part or a member of a team. Um, also, a challenge was helping the parents to understand the platform and how to best help their child at home get logged in, um, utilize the different components. So we spent quite a few uh, weeks in the very beginning, just familiarizing our students and parents with the Teams platform itself and how to do assignments through Teams, how to use a tablet for those lower grade students um, and a laptop um, to submit assignments, which was very new. So that has been the most challenging part. Um, our younger students, um, with not as much uh, dexterity in their hands and their fine motor skills are not as refined as older students and using a, a, a finger to draw or to write or a stylus um, has been a little bit challenging for us. But just the more practice that they've had with it, it has gotten much better than it was the first week of school. What will you focus on in order to make sure that virtual learning will remain sustainable? Uh, what we will focus on is uh, communication and transparency with our families and um, our school. So uh, we like to host monthly meetings with our families and go over aspects of teams and how to best use teams and how to support students at home through virtual learning. So we plan on keeping the lines of communication open daily uh, with our parents just to get feedback from them on what's working and what's not working. And we're also willing to make adjustments as needed so that the kids are as successful as possible with this new type of environment. 
Well, Ms. Sanders, do you believe students are receiving the same educational benefits online as they would with in-person learning? I definitely think there are some positives to online learning. Um, it helps our students to become more proficient with technology, which is moving us into the direction of where um, learning should be going and where things are going to transform. I think it also prepares them for in the wake of anything that comes up, they're prepared to transition between both. There are some benefits to being in the building, of course, um, especially with kindergarten and first grade students. But I also think this provides them an opportunity to be more proficient with technology and how to use it in such a, um, a strong technological world that we live in today. What improvements do you think need to be made in order for the virtual platform to remain successful? Um, I think that we could definitely um, use more parent support at home and um, more training and just support with parents on how the platform works and how um, students will learn best by learning virtually. Um, it's new for many of our parents and we just have to continue um, to work together as a team to make sure that the students receive the best support from their home environment that they will receive if they were in the brick and mortar building. Can you talk about your responsibilities as the principal of Germantown Elementary and how they've changed because of the pandemic? I can say though, seriously, Kaylin, I've never been a pandemic principal before. <laughs> So this has been a very new um, and exciting experience for me. Um, I've enjoyed learning alongside um, our teachers, you know, how to best use Teams, um, how to engage with our students through the Teams platform. And like I said, we're growing every day with ideas and new strategies and ways to keep our students engaged and keep our instructional program strong um, throughout this uh, whole pandemic. Um, but I can venture to say that this has been a learning experience for me too. And I have grown more uh, tech savvy than I was in the past. And, and I'm just trying to push our teachers and staff to grow with that change as well. Has there been any talk at all of how students will be brought back to the classroom once COVID cases eventually drop? So our administration team continuously reviews uh, different scenarios. Uh, for our students so that we're prepared for whatever uh, the case may be. And we definitely follow the lead and direction of our great superintendent, Dr. Ray. And whatever his vision is, uh, we will develop and adapt our plan around that. So before we even entered the school year, we had discussion around what would instruction look like if we were in the building and what will instruction look like for our students virtually so that we are best prepared for either scenario. Um, so although there's not a definite date of a return back to school, uh, we have discussed what would be the best plan for our students when they do return back to the building. Well, this was a great conversation. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Caitlin, for having me. I've enjoyed it as well. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we will hear about the controversial decision one school district superintendent made while handling a rapidly growing community. We'll be right back. GHSCV started in 1982, and it was just a couple of cameras, a couple of on-air personality, and it's really grown into what you see today. It's a multi-million dollar studio with top-of-the-line technology. Being able to operate you know, all of the machinery in the control room, uh, being able to use all of our software and hardware that we have around the studio uh, is a great skill because this is top-of-the-line equipment. I feel like this class has brightened my horizon. It's something that I never thought I would be doing, um, especially as a student. GHS TV is probably one of the most hands-on experiences a student will ever get in their lifetime. Welcome back to Crosstalk. Nothing really has just the vibe that we have here. Especially after you finish, you get a real rush of, wow, I just did that. By the time a student graduates from Germantown High School, they will know pretty much every position there is. 
from producing to directing um, to on-air work. You learn time management, you learn organization, you learn how to work with people, how to better communicate with people. We put a lot on them and they have to be able to have the responsibility and the knowledge to get everything that we ask them. I had very little experience, uh, so in the past three years, the skills that I've learned have, have absolutely exponentially grown. The class has actually helped me figure out that I want to go to college for journalism. When a student graduates, they are the best possible version of themselves that they can be. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. For more information about the Kappa program, visit ghskappa.com or call 755-7775. watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to this special virtual edition of Crosstalk. Lakeland School System is one of the suburban school districts that welcomes students back to the classroom this year. They, along with hundreds of schools across the country, have implemented completely new procedures to keep students safe while they are learning. With me now to talk about the decision to bring students back to the classroom is Lakeland School Superintendent, Dr. Ted Horrell. Dr. Horrell, thank you for being here with me today. Thanks, Caitlin, it's great to be here. Over the summer, you released the Safer at School plan outlining your students' return. Can you go into some of the details? Sure. We really uh, we spent the better part of the, the spring and summer really kind of working on it, working with uh, both the community, parents, our school board, our teachers to kind of find out what was important to them. And uh, we knew or felt like that uh, students learn best in person so that we wanted to try to do that to the extent that we could. And uh, once we kind of uh, started with that premise, it became a matter of how many students can we educate safely? So uh, we, we knew it was the, the right way to do it, but we had to do it safely. So it, at that point, it, it kind of became almost a geometry problem. We had to figure out uh, how many students could we get in our facilities uh, with the appropriate six feet of uh, distancing between them. And that involved, it started just doing the math on the room sizes, and then we figured out, look, we've got to get in the classrooms and arrange the furniture and, and had the tape measure and uh, we figured out we had to remove any extra furniture that was in there. And um, we, we kind of, it worked better at the elementary school, but at the middle school, what we determined was we couldn't get all the students that we needed to in the classrooms. So if we wanted to bring them all back five days a week, what would that look like? And uh, kind of, I guess the innovation that we made was setting up what we call big rooms, the library, the cafeteria, and the gym, uh, with in some cases 80 desks spaced six feet apart. And we kind of settled on a model where the middle school students would have three days a week of in-person instruction and two days a week uh, doing what we call DCI, which is uh, digital and customized instruction, where they're working more independently, but they're at school. So it was kind of like a hybrid program, except they were still coming to school every day. Well, Lakeland Elementary School is currently one of the few schools in Tennessee doing complete in-person learning. What are some of the factors that led to this result? Well, and I, and I will say at both schools, we gave parents the option to do remote learning. So at Lakeland Elementary, uh, about 236 of the students or their parents decided to learn remotely. And at the middle school, 199, just about 200 students uh, were doing remote learning for the first nine weeks. So uh, especially for the elementary school, we felt like it was critical that those students in grades K through four, which is our elementary school, get that in-person instruction, get that social stimulation, even though it's different. They're not, they're not, you know, able to touch each other, even, you know, play with each other or even do centers in the way that they used to. But still, after all that time at home, we knew that it was gonna be critical to bring those young students back in particular. So that, that was a priority. We were really pleased to be able to bring everybody in grades K through eight back. Well, while Lakeland Elementary is diving in with in-person learning, Lakeland Preparatory has taken a different route with hybrid learning. Why did you think it would be best for these schools to have different learning plans? Well, like I said, the only really difference in the plans was um, that at the middle school at Lakeland Preparatory, the students weren't in the classroom every single day, but they were at school every single day. So we offered five day a week instruction for both schools. You previously mentioned the digitally converted classrooms that students are participating in. Can you explain what these are and what benefits these bring to students? 
Sure. So uh, that's really at the middle school at Lakeland Preparatory School. Uh, we, we set up the spaces that we had where students could not be accommodated in the regular classrooms. We figured out that in a regular classroom we could get no more than 17 students and that's really if we stretch it. Um, six feet apart. So the students that couldn't fit in those scenarios, uh, we used every bit of space we had available. Then that was the library, the cafeteria, the gym. Uh, we set up desks six feet apart. And those students are working much more independently, but they also get pulled out for things like their, uh, what we call their maps instruction, music, art, and PE, and also their exploratory classes like uh, world languages and STEM and creative writing. According to the Lakeland School System website, since LES opened in 2001, the student population has gone through what is called an extraordinary growth phase. It can now hold up to 1,000 students. Do you think the pandemic will affect this in the future? Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. We haven't seen that this year. Uh, the numbers were slightly, just very slightly below projections at Lakeland Preparatory School. And I only mention that because they've been way over projection every year since the school opened. We've just had a hard time getting a handle on uh, the number of new students that we've had. Uh, so the fact that it was at all below was uh, only surprising because it just never is. It doesn't seem to have impacted enrollment. I do think just generally speaking in terms of education, uh, the pandemic probably is causing people to evaluate other options for what instruction looks like. Uh, and, you know, certainly the, uh, the remote instruction that we were kind of forced to learn to do, uh, we feel like we're learning to do it pretty well. So that, that may open up some possibilities for students that traditionally may have been uh, homeschooled or homebound. And uh, just depending on uh, uh, the options that are presented by the legislature, it may be something that we look at moving forward. What all have you learned throughout this time of uncertainty? I tell you what, I have really learned that, um, uh, and I knew this before, but teachers are, I think, really, really underappreciated. If there's any doubt about it, I think when schools shut down, uh, we heard from parents, we hear from community members. Uh, I, I've never seen such a drive to get kids in school. And, uh, you know, I think maybe it was fun for people for a little bit to think, hey, we're out of school. But it, even the kids were like, I need to be back at school. And I think it uh, uh, hopefully leads to an appreciation of public schools in particular and, and what's provided uh, in our community for, for parents and students. Uh, and I have learned, and I think we've, we've all learned together, just uh, how flexible and how resilient we are. Uh, every, everybody, not just schools, has, has had to learn to do so many things differently from an interview on Crosstalk uh, to a, a, you know, a, a class that's being, a science class that's being taught remotely or even in person. So uh, these, are, these are all things that I think were beyond our imagination that we'd be capable of. And uh, we've all, I think, done pretty well and, and are figuring out together. Well, Dr. Horrell, it was great having you on our first virtual edition of Crosstalk. Thank you for joining me today. It was an honor to be invited. Thank you. We will explore a different perspective on how this altered version of education can affect students both physically and mentally. Please stay with us. Art is really an expression of the self. If you look at a piece of art, you can see the artist within it. All just really depends on what I feel like doing at the time. I generally have different ideas every day. I really get excited when my students come up to me with unique ideas that I've not heard of. You can't let everybody tell you who you are or what your art is or how to be what you want to be. I really let the students go according to how they're progressing and I try to give them as much as they're able to handle. Well I like drawing a lot and I like painting and I like being able to um, improve my skill and show people my art. I try to get them to think creatively. I think that's one of the few things that we as teachers really need to try to push with our students. I can't sing. I can't act either. But I can do art. So that's why I chose art. For more information about the CAPA program, visit GHSCAPA.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to the special virtual edition of Crosstalk. 
I'm Caitlin Poindexter. While we have spent most of this show talking about the changes students are enduring in school, we will shift now to exploring the effects these changes have on students at home. The physical health of students is not only at risk due to COVID-19, but their mental health as well. With me now to discuss the psychology possibly occurring in students during this time is SES school social worker, Stephanie Nelson. Ms. Nelson, thank you for joining me today. With Shelby thank County Schools me. going all virtual, how has the student services department at the board changed? Um, with the mental health center, we are still providing services to our students virtually through MS team. We are meeting with them weekly for individual family and group sessions. We still receive um, our referrals through the school guidance through the school guidance office. So nothing really has changed except for us providing it virtually. We're still providing the students with the services that are needed. In what ways has the virtual world changed the mental health of students? Um, as with anybody, change is something different for everyone. It was something that we had to get accustomed to as to doing it virtually with the students. Um, having some anxiety, um, being overwhelmed with everything that's going on because some students Students are visual learners, um, some are constatic, but us, we're still able to be there for them and to give them the support that's needed with the students as well as with the administrators. Do you believe that learning online will prohibit students from actually learning new material or do you believe it's just added stress? That depends on each child. Each child is different on how they learn and how they're able to cope with the different changes there of what's going on. Um, during this time, depending on with the student, especially with the smaller students, they're used to the interaction there with the teachers. So it's going to be harder for them to adjust than with probably the middle schoolers or the high schoolers of what they're needing to do. But as far as with the teachers are keeping the students engaged in what they're needing to do, as well as the parents, I think that the students will do well. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, students have lost that in-person connection with their teachers. How important is it to have this on a student's journey through education? Um, it's very important, but also um, for students as they go to secondary, post-secondary education, there are um, online courses and some schools are online. So this is kind of giving them that opportunity for them to get adjusted to what online schooling would be like for them. Well, many students are experiencing a domino effect, for lack of a better word, with the start of the school year, including dramatic drop of grades, less resources, loneliness, and other negative effects. Can you elaborate on how this could affect the mental state of students? Um, in that sense, there is very important to have the children engaged um, during their classes there. Um, social emotional learning is very important for the mental health, we do have a social emotional learning hotline where parents or um, students may call in that hotline where we can give them some additional support of what is needed for them during this pandemic time. Um, for teenagers, one of the things they've, um, with new technology and media, is they've always been accustomed to the social media of different things that's going on. So right now is that it's giving families an opportunity for them to sit down, have dinners and talk. So it's in that sense where it's not a domino effect, it's helping the children to rebuild their family connection. There are thousands of students in kindergarten or pre-kindergarten they not only have no clue what is going on, but they are starting their very first year of school altogether. How do you think this will affect their learning in the future? Uh, very big adjustment there for kindergartners. They need that, they're touchy-feely people. So it will um, affect them to a certain extent, but I think with the teachers engaging with them and providing the services and having the school counselors there as they're providing their guidance, um, classroom settings and the social workers being involved, that close support would assist them to, for them to maintain. Well, it's hard for younger student, students, excuse me, to pay attention to class as it is, but when they are completely virtual, parents are having to supervise them 24 seven to make sure they're getting all the materials they need. How can this role shift from parent to teacher affect their mental abilities as well? 
Self-care is very, very important. And for the parents of getting that time there to do self-care, because a lot of parents aren't teachers. So some of my coworkers that are having to do their work as well as to assist their um, students, it's very hard, but they're still being able to maintain and what they need to do. So self-care is very important and even for them reaching out to someone to talk to for that extra support and help with their coping skills. Because it's about coping skills of what everyone needs to do today, being able to cope with the change. But parents have felt like they are having to choose between their kids getting a good education and staying safe, which ultimately is an impossible choice for any family. How can parents look at this in a positive sense to help relieve an element of stress from their already busy lives? Um, that's uh, that's kind of hard there, but the, yet again, that depends on each parent and what they have and what's going on with them. Um, very stressful time of, because I could say for myself, I wouldn't know what to do on try to teach a child because everything is different now. So I would need a tutor for myself to be able to assist the students. So it's still as to finding that extra support there for the parents and letting them know and that you understand what they're going through and to be able to provide for them that extra support so they have an outlet where they can talk to. If it's a being on a um, parent family connect there where they can have their own virtual um, teams where they can the parents can get together and they can talk about what's going on that support system there because they can bounce ideas off of each other of how to be able to cope during a situation as this. But there are many teachers that are struggling with this uncertain time of education as well. With them being used to having a noisy room filled with students, they are now embracing the emptiness of their teaching space. How can this change affect a teacher's mental state and how could this affect their teaching methods as well? Change is something different for everyone. So it does go to going back to the drawing board and seeing on what you need to do for you to be able to cope with the situations there for, and even for teachers that have a support group where they can bounce ideas off of each other and what they'll need to do to be able to engage their children virtually. But what resources do parents and students have that they can use to alleviate the troubles that they're experiencing? They can always contact their um, professional school counselor and contact the school social worker. Each school in the district has a social worker that they can contact to. Also, some of the resources, I actually got this from another school, is Aunt Bertha's Social Care Network. Um, they can go there, they can put in their zip code, and it gives many different um, resources available in their areas. Well, Ms. Nelson, this was a great conversation. Thank you for talking with me today. Thank you for inviting me. According to health experts, we won't be out of the clear until a COVID-19 vaccine is readily available. That is expected to be sometime next year. So virtual and hybrid school is the new reality until that happens. But one thing is for certain, we have proven that we are stronger together and can win against anything that comes our way. For more information on our programming, please check us out on the web at ghstv.org where we are streaming live 24 hours a day. You can also check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Caitlin Poindexter from all of us here at GHS-TV. Thank you for watching Crosstalk, and I hope to see you again.